I just want to introduce the adventurous Luke Martin. I've been reading a lot about you briefly. Um, he's a teacher at BAC and he teaches um, like creative arts and technology. <laughs> Something like that you'll find out. Um, I found out he has experience being like a helicopter and airplane pilot. He's also, um, his joy from being in the air, he's also been a part of a senior climb leader at the Sydney um, Harbour Bridge, which is very, very cool. Um, he's from a family of five and they're known to love travelling and they're often going on ridiculously long um, road trips around Australia my type of thing, or international flights to the USA whenever possible, fingers crossed. Um, if he had a preference, there would be a ban on shoes everywhere, like his bare feet right now, and for the school uniform in schools, also including an Akubra hat, very Australian. His attitude in life is that there are a thousand solutions to every problem, and he loves failure. Thanks, Martin. Thank you very much. How is everyone today? Good, good, good. Cold, cold. Sorry, Xander, I can't help you with that one. <laughs> we'll we'll on that one. Okay. I am uh, blessed. Okay. Um, is this going to work? We'll go back a little bit. Sorry. See if we can get back to the start. We might just miss the first bit. Okay, so failing to succeed, the value of failure in creativity. Is it, who likes to fail? <laughs> who likes to fail? Yeah, great. <laughs> because failure is important. Okay, I'm so blessed. And we'll go to the next photo. I'm. So, well, there we go. Failure to succeed. <laughs> Failing already. Uh, <laughs> the value of failure and creativity. I grew up accustomed to being a failure. I therefore was a glass, glass half empty individual. I never did well in school. I didn't fit the ideal educational model. I seemingly couldn't do anything right or as expected. I was also a regular at the principal's office. Um, I, the the um, secretary would always leave a minty on the desk as I would come out. She, you know, and wink, and it's okay. So I was up there quite often. I was not always sure that the reason I was set up there was fair, but I knew for one thing. I was a failure, and I was reminded of it regularly. At home, I grew up in a unique setting. My father is a master potter and my mother a nurse. My days were filled with practical challenges. We broke things, fixed things, pulled things apart. We found snakes regularly, because we lived on property. That wasn't a failure, by the way. It was quite intentional. Um, so this is my dad, uh, uh, quite a while ago, his hair is still and there's not that colour anymore, but we would find snakes quite regularly, um, and uh, he'd say, he'd love to put them in his pots and say, "Oh, have a look at this new one." And people would take the lid off, and this, you know, um, it, it was not always the kindest thing to do. Um, we pulled things apart, built things, and uh, this is my brother, by the way. Sorry. Uh, it's definitely my brother because I can't grow facial hair at all. And uh, our favourite thing, being a potter's family, is we lit things on fire all the time, like regularly, and I often would get in trouble for lighting the paddocks on fire. But it was a very bonding experience. You go out there and try and put the thing out again. So um, I thought this was, this was normal. I thought every family made things at home, fixed things that were broken, or built things that they needed. I genuinely believed that every household had a functioning workshop in the backyard. Where would you otherwise build your furniture, repair the car, or tinker away to bedtime? Problem solving. 
Innovation and creativity were the norm at home. I then went to school and couldn't do anything right. I had to do it like this. It needed to be just like that. Otherwise, I wasn't doing it right and I was going to fail. I was simply a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. It took me a number of years to shed off a few things and come to a big conclusion. Failure is positive. I was always told that failure was bad, but without failure, we have no autonomy. Think about it. God gave us the gift of choice to make mistakes, to go our own way, or to follow him. While I was learning to fly in high school, I did get the opportunity to fly in high school. I, it was French or flying, so I chose flying. Uh, while, I was allowed, while I was flying in high school, I was allowed by my instructors to make mistakes, within reason, obviously. This allowed me to find my abilities independently within a safe place and to explore the boundaries of what was possible. Now, growing up, um, I, I, I have a few fears. Uh, one of them was heights, one of them was most definitely needles, um, and blood was not always the great one. So I, I, I became a pilot, and I remember my first flight, we took off and we're heading out towards Lake Macquarie, and the instructor, Chad was his name, the instructor said, all right, you can level off now. I didn't want to go down, I was just like, oh, we'll just keep going, keep going. So we, we overcame that and we kept moving on. I eventually, uh, later on, um, became an otter, uh, an operating theatre assistant um, in, uh, at the SAN. And um, that was full of needles and blood. Um, so that was uh, very, very um, full on. Later on, I fulfilled a passion uh, or a dream, an absolute monstrous dream of becoming a helicopter pilot. And towards the end of my um, uh, flying experience, I had a very dramatic experience. Um, I'll show you this photo. That is a helicopter flying. It's in a tree. It is still moving forward, but not properly. Okay? This is quite an event that has a, a very groundbreaking um, effect on your life, okay? You uh, go through that and you make sure that that never occurs again. Fortunately, I'm here. I, I, do, I, I, was in, I was in the back seat here and I had my camera and I was taking photos because I was going to make this wonderful lesson plan of how this particular lesson was to work. And I just remember holding the bar in front of me and clicking away, thinking, well, we've got to have evidence of what happened here. Um, and um, I walked away, which is really a blessing. Um, and there's only one way I walked away, a blessing of God. Some experiences of failure are so incredibly defining for a person that they will shape the rest of their lives for good or bad. Okay, this story I'm going to tell you for some reason, chokes me up. Okay, so we'll get through it really, trying quickly. Okay, there was a, a place I used to work down in Sydney, and I was an abseiling instructor, and you'd get school groups coming through by the hour, and you'd have to get all these kids down the abseiling face, and everyone was so joyful and happy and, you know, boisterous. You get them all down, but I did notice this one boy, Daniel. He was up the back of the group, up the top of the uh, where we were set up, and he was just kind of wringing his hands. He was terrified. He did not want to come over, he didn't put a harness on, didn't put a helmet on, didn't come anywhere near. The event, the session finished, his whole class moved away and he just stood there, almost frozen. And I walked over to him, his teacher was still there, and she said, you okay? I said, you're right, do you, do you want to have a go? Are you, are you scared? I said, what if, we, what if I help you? I said, okay. So, over he comes, harness on, and hook him up, and there's a bit of time going through this whole experience. He gets to the edge, and he's shaking, 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 shaking. 
and he loads the, who's, who's abseiled before? Yeah? Who's experienced that little bit when you go from here to here to here to, okay? It's, and once you get down there a little bit, she's much better, okay? You're like, I've got this, I could do that 10 times more, okay? But that little bit there. So Daniel, he was not, he, he was needing the larger harness. He was, a, he was a bigger boy. That's not the problem. The fear was the problem. The doubt was the problem. Once we got him to that edge, he just loaded the rope, sitting there, and his eyes widened and pierced through me. And I realised he lost his bladder control. He had these heavy denim khaki, oh, no, not khaki, they were camouflage print pants and this big T-shirt over. And he was terrified. Absolutely terrified. I said, it's okay. Absolutely fine. And we got him, we got him down across the cliff, down to the bottom, and he's jumping with joy. Jumping with joy. Have you ever overcome something like that? That, that, that? You believed with your whole soul that you could never do anything. You were worthless. He had overcome it. His teacher was down the bottom, gave him a huge hug, ignored it. The whole realisation that he now had very visibly wet himself then came over him. And she's like, don't worry about it. I, I really felt for him. You know, I really, really felt for him. And they're walking back and his whole school, his whole grade level was up on the balcony waiting to go in for lunch and it was only moments before they realised that Daniel had wet himself. And I felt for him so bad. And that's right when his teacher pushed him in the dam. <laughs> Turning failure into success. That's creativity. <laughs> Whether or not we know the actual risk we are taking the perceived risk is what impacts the personal outcome for each individual. You might be totally fine going across, or going over an abseiling cliff or anything like that. The person next to you, it might be a totally different story. Totally different story. The outcome of achieving that result is what matters. I don't... Uh, oh, sorry, I do apologise. As Australians, we embrace uh, uh, and celebrate failures. We love the underdog story. Historical figures such as Ned Kelly have a hero status attached to them. They ultimately failed, but as a nation, we seem to have a spot in our hearts for them. We kind of lift them up. Oh, like sticking it to the man, and you know this this guy, you know, got to it. it this fella was pretty creative. Okay, he made himself a suit of armor. They um, they struggled with that one. Okay, individuals like this we celebrate, but for some reason in our schools, failure is this dreadful thing. Now, I don't consider myself to be a particularly creative person. If you say, Luke. I want you to make something creative. Just do something. I'm lost. Just totally stumped. And you ask me to solve a problem, I feel pretty comfortable there. The two concepts of creativity and problem solving are intrinsically linked. Creativity occurs when people accept that risk and failure is inherently a part of a successful creative process. You can't truly create, push the boundaries, do something new without the high potential of failure. How many people in here like to draw? Are there any just general artists? Okay, good, good, good. Now, how many of you like to draw something and say, hey, rate me, what do you reckon? 
Just pass it around. Everyone write the note down. Are you comfortable to do that? Are you, uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'll let everyone judge me right there. One of the most difficult things to do is convince someone who is not willing to fail to risk failing, to risk not getting it right. We have this preconceived idea of what's right and what's wrong. Okay? It is counterintuitive to our sense of safety to fail. Now, this is an idea I had, which is now being uh, conferred by a few other people. Um, there is a, currently a tsunami of students who are only concerned in the outcome of their grade. Who's experienced that? If you have kids at school or if you've been through school, I've heard over and over again, Sir, what do I need to do to get an A? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I actually don't. Um, <laughs> How can we move our students' motivation from an extrinsic incentive to an intrinsic one? I often wonder if it's an educational failure or a cultural one. We're constantly pushing, 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 pushing. You need to do well at school. You need to do well at school. Why are you failing? What's the attitude we're sending home? Who's felt that? Who's felt like, I am never going to be good enough? Yeah, <laughs> it's me. Okay, I was constantly feeling that I would never be good enough. I set my students up for initial failure, intentionally. So many of them are terrified of not succeeding, which is an initial barrier that I need to help them overcome. This often leads to students playing it safe and, and more often not even attempting at all. If you're scared of failure, you won't even try. How many of you can walk along a thin plank on this floor, even with your eyes closed? Put it a foot off the ground. Put it a metre off the ground. Put it even higher. Everything, your confidence is shot to pieces. The perceived risk of what you've got to lose increases, increases, increases. Yeah? I tell them at the start of the year, I expect you to fail, 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 and then we'll succeed. Because if you can't fail, if you've done it all perfectly, I haven't taught you anything. I haven't taught you a thing. I want you to fail. Okay? There's quite a number of my students in here. <laughs> they do pretty well. They do pretty well. Google conducted an experiment where, well, it was actually an initiative um, more than an experiment, whereby they gave their engineers a financial incentive to produce something new and marketable, something that they hadn't said, hey, we want you to develop this idea, okay? We're coming from a corporate position and we're telling you that you're going to make this. Um, and if you did well, you would get a financial incentive from it, right? A reward. This seems like something we've possibly heard before, yeah? They found that productivity dived, dived really sharply. They stopped that and they said, once a quarter we're going to give you three days. All work that we've asked you to do stops and we're going to give you three days to do whatever you want. Your passionate work, your, your little pet projects, your dreams, whatever it may be. And they set, saw this immediate uptake. There was safety given. We, we don't expect anything. If you produce nothing, that's fine. But if you do something cool, hey, let's all celebrate that. Let's, let's, let's be blessed from it. They saw this massive uptake in the output from their engineers. When you give someone freedom, they become limitless. Encourage risk-taking, risk and reward. Our young people want to learn and be more, better versions of themselves. There is a thirst for it amongst them. But to develop truly innovative, creative young people, we need them to once again believe that taking a chance and risking failure is worth it. Thomas Edison. Now, 
Thomas Edison was a pretty cool dude. He made a lot of things, and he made a lot of failures too. His teacher said he was too stupid to learn anything. He was fired from his first two jobs for being non-productive, as he would simply want to tinker and not do his assigned role as described. I was always found tinkering instead of working. They had a problem with me tinkering. I didn't know that was the wrong thing to do. I thought that's, that's, that's what you do. As we know, Edison made over a thousand unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. Now, the question that all teachers are, ask are, how do we inspire our students? How do we encourage them to think outside the box? How do we get them to be glass half full individuals? John Rich suggests that schools are haunted by failure. Failure haunts the hallways, the grounds, the classroom. It insituates itself in the lives of the school's inhabitants. I worry about failure. I fail quite often. I try things, it fails. I try to, something else, it fails. And then occasionally I'll get something right. We usually only talk about the bits that we get right though, don't we? We don't generally celebrate the bits that we didn't get right. Last year, um, we had our blessed COVID and then uh, Brisbane had our lockdown. All the kids went. Now, that was fine for the English teachers. It was fine for the math teachers. They had all their books and online this and online that. And I had my big workshop to my colleague and ourselves. We had a lot of fun, but how do we do our job? We still had to do something practical. So we, uh, we came up with this um, pretty cool thing. Our, our kids were disconnected. We um, built this. It went in an A4 envelope. And it had a mouse trap in it and the string and the, and the pencils and everything it needed. And it was just almost limitless potential project. Now, we were also t teaching them, as a part of the engineering projects, um, moment arm theory. So the longer the lever, the more power you have. But inversely, it can have the opposite effect when you're trying to pull something. This design took many, many days constantly to produce. It only cost about 80 cents. We innovatively, creatively, changed our practice to meet the needs of our students who we couldn't actually make contact with. Students who actually engaged with it were able to be very, very, um, not so much very, very sorry, they were able to put their practice, what they're learning in the theory, into, uh, into a tangible outcome. It was really neat. Now, I've already read that one, sorry. Now, uh, my dad is, as I said earlier, he was a fine arts lecturer at Avondale College. And so he told me this the other day. Creativity is the belief that everything and anything can be done better. If you don't believe that, well, you're still not willing to fail. That doubt in yourself is still there. My hope in this is to have students realise that to fail does not make them a failure. I want them to know it is okay to fail, but not to concede defeat. Thank you, everyone.